Hi guys, welcome to this video on carbohydrates as a macronutrient. We're going to think in this video a little bit about what carbohydrates are. We'll talk a little bit about the chemistry and how that influences how carbohydrates work and their role in our diet. And we'll talk about uh, what carbohydrates are used for and how they're stored. And then we'll talk about what foods actually contain carbohydrates. So let's get started. So the three main macronutrients that we need to uh, know about are carbohydrates, which is what we're going to focus on in this video, lipids and proteins. And the first thing to note about these three different macronutrients is that they all have a different energy density, energy density. So this is going to influence how much of each of these macronutrients we need to consume to meet energy requirements. So carbohydrates have an energy density. That's how much energy per gram an energy density of four kilocalories per gram of carbohydrate. So for every gram of carbohydrate you eat, you're consuming four kilocalories of energy. When it comes to lipids, which we often refer to simply as fats, we find that they have nine kilo kilocalories per gram. So nine kilocalories of energy for every gram of fat that you eat. And proteins, very similar to carbs, also have approximately four kilocalories per gram. Each of those numbers is, is rounded, but it's there or thereabouts. Carbs and proteins, roughly the same, about four kilocalories per gram. But lipids have a much higher energy, energy density than the other two. So in terms of carbohydrates, we're going to be looking at sugars, starches and fiber as the three classifications of carbohydrates. Let's begin though by thinking about the role of carbs in our diet. So the whole purpose of consuming carbohydrates is because we want the stuff that the carbohydrates are made up of. Now the smallest subunit of a carbohydrate, um, that's what we're after. So as we eat these carbohydrates, we chew them, we have um, enzymes act on them to break them down and we break them down into this smallest subunit which is glucose. So carbohydrates, no matter what they are, they're broken down, whether they be sugars or starches, they're broken down into glucose. And now we've got glucose in our system, we can now do something useful with it. So there's two main things that we do with this glucose. The first thing and the most important thing we do with it is we use it for energy production. We use it for energy in our bodies. And there's three main areas that we use this glucose in terms of energy production. And they are basal metabolism, so BMR, basal metabolic rate. That's just the amount of energy that we use to keep ourselves alive, to keep ourselves ticking over, to keep things working. We use some energy for digestion, known as the thermal effect. And we also use some energy for exercise. And that will obviously go up and down depending on how much exercise we do. So those three things um, partly relate to how much exercise we do, but also relate to the size of our bodies, how much muscle we're carrying and so on. So the glucose that we consume that we've, we've got after having broken down these carbs, this glucose is used for energy production and our energy demands will depend on those three factors. Now then, once that glucose has met those energy demands, if we have still more glucose in the system, because we've eaten more carbs than really we needed to, there's a couple of things that will happen to that glucose. And that glucose will be converted into a couple of different things. So as far as conversion goes, that glucose is converted to, in the first instance, it's converted to glycogen, which we refer to as the stored form of glucose. So glycogen, glucose, they're very similar words, aren't they? But glycogen is the stored form of glucose. We put the glucose together into longer chains to make it into glycogen. And then that glycogen is stored somewhere where it can be accessed later. And there are two main stores for that glycogen. It's stored in the muscle, which obviously we refer to as muscle glycogen. And it's also stored in the liver, which unsurprisingly is known as liver glycogen. So any excess glucose that we consume beyond what's needed for basal metabolism and digestion and exercise, anything additional will then be stored or converted to glycogen and stored in the muscle 
or the liver and sometimes used to top up those stores if those stores have run low but also if we've got yet more carbohydrate in the system we've still got more glucose to deal with there's something else we can do with it we can also convert it to triglycerides and this is where it gets really interesting because a triglyceride is in fact a fat but it's a fat partially made up of carbohydrate so this is where fats and carbohydrates in the diet the whole thing becomes a little bit more complex a triglyceride is a glycerol backbone a glycerol molecule with three fatty acids attached to it so it's kind of a combination but we, we class it as a fat and so those triglycerides are then stored in our fat stores so it's possible therefore to if you consume sufficient amounts of carbohydrate you you consume more than you need for energy production you consume more than you need to top up the muscle glycogen stores and the liver glycogen stores and you've still got more left over that will be converted into triglycerides and stored in your fat stores so you can actually increase your fat stores through overconsumption of carbohydrates okay so let's dig just a little bit deeper now so we've thought about the role of carbohydrates in the diet um, but we've already acknowledged that there are different types of carbohydrates and they actually have slightly different roles within the diet because they have slightly different structures and functions. So let's think about that now. So in terms of the structure of sugars, starches and fiber, the first thing to note is that they're all carbohydrates because they're chains of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. So all carbohydrates are chains of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Now, if we take the smallest subunit that we can, that's small enough to still be a carbohydrate, but if we broke it down any further, it would no longer be a carbohydrate, then what we have is called a mono, meaning one, monosaccharide. It's the smallest single subunit of carbohydrate that we can have. That might be, for example, glucose. Glucose is a monosaccharide. You can't break glucose down anymore without it no longer being a carbohydrate but you could take glucose and add another glucose molecule to it so now you've got two glucose molecules attached to one another that would be known as a di as in two disaccharide monosaccharide one subunit disaccharide two subunits and once we get to three four five six and so on and we can go a very long way with these um, adding subunits on subunits, adding glucoses to one another. We can go quite a long way with that. We start then to talk about polysaccharides, poly meaning many. So we have mono and disaccharides, where there's a single subunit or, or a pair of subunits. So a pair of glucoses, for example, so speaking precisely. A pair of glucoses would be a disaccharide because there's two of them. A single one would be a monosaccharide and they would be classified as sugars. So this is one of the classifications, the way that we classify a sugar as opposed to a starch. Even though they're all carbohydrates, a sugar is a monosaccharide or a disaccharide, whereas any polysaccharides are either starches or fiber. Now this relates to the complexity of the molecule. So as you can probably imagine so by complexity what we mean is how many links are there in the chain so if we're chaining these glucose molecules or fructose molecules together or whatever it might be how many links are there and the more links in the chain the more complex the structure so you may have heard of people talk about simple carbs and complex carbs and this is where it comes from it's to do with the number of links in the chain so simple carbs are sugars but complex carbs would be starches or fiber. Now the difference between starches and fibers you can see on the screen is that starches are complex carbs that the body can break down into smaller pieces, into smaller chunks for its use as we've thought of already. Whereas fiber is a kind of complex carbohydrate, still a carbohydrate because it's a polysaccharide, it's made up of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, but it, the body can't break it down. It's basically indigestible. So we have simple carbs, which are simple in terms of complexity, that's sugars. And then we've got complex carbs that are digestible, those are starches. 
and we've got complex carbs that are indigestible and that is fiber. Now the confusion comes when there are some foods, for example, that contain both sugars and fiber. Okay, so fruits are a good example. Fruits contain fructose, which is fruit sugar, but also often the skin or the pith or the rind also contains fiber. So we're, we're speaking somewhat in theoretical terms here because lots of foodstuffs will have combinations of these different types of sugars. Let's move on. So in terms of sweetness, there is a direct link between the complexity of the sugar, its chemical structure, and the sweetness. You could probably just already know or already guess which way around this works. So the shorter the chain, the sweeter the taste. The shorter the chain, the sweeter the taste. So therefore, obviously, at the sugar end of the spectrum, mono and disaccharides, they're the sweet tasting sugars, the sweet tasting carbs. And then at the other end, when we get through the starches, the longer the, or the more complex, to be precise, the more complex the structure, the less sweet it's going to taste. So fiber generally doesn't taste sweet. Starches may or may not, they're somewhere in the middle, but sugars certainly do taste sweet. And that's because they have a simple uh, structure. After this, then we've got the glycemic index. Now you may or may not have heard of the glycemic index. The glycemic index indicates, the GI, indicates how quickly a foodstuff, whether, when you've eaten it, how quickly does it elevate your blood glucose level? So how quickly does the glucose get into your bloodstream? Okay, so those sugars that we've broken down, those monodisaccharides, those polysaccharides in particular that have to be broken down into smaller and smaller chunks, when it gets to the point that they're broken down as glucose, how quickly does that glucose actually get into your bloodstream? So that depends on the food and it, basically it depends on the complexity of the carbohydrate. So a, a simple carbohydrate like a sugar gets into your bloodstream much more quickly. So it has what we know as a high glycemic index. Higher glycemic index means faster faster elevation of blood glucose. So sugars have a high, are high on the glycemic index. Starches are in the mid range and fiber, you could argue they're not on the glycemic index at all, or we could just stick with saying that they're low on the glycemic index because they don't really have much impact at all on blood glucose levels. After this, we've got something which is related. This is the insulin index. So diabetics will be particularly aware of the importance of insulin. Insulin is a hormone that regulates our blood sugar levels. So obviously it's going to be linked in quite closely with the glycemic index. But essentially the higher insulin index, a higher insulin index indicates the greater release of insulin into the bloodstream. And that's per calorie of the food that you've eaten. So per calorie of sugar, per calorie of starch, per calorie of fiber, how much insulin or to what extent is insulin released into the bloodstream in response to consuming that type of food? OK, so again, very similar to the glycemic index. Sugars cause a higher insulin index response the more insulin released into the bloodstream in response to sugars. Starches, less so fiber, the least. And so finally, we've got this concept of satiety and satiety comes from the same root word as satisfaction or satisfied. And this simply means um, how long do you feel full after this type of food? How long do you feel full? So once you've eaten sugars, how long does it keep you full? Once you've eaten starches, how long does that keep you full? So that's, this is the concept of satiety and satiety uh, for sugars is low. So we eat them and then fairly quickly we're hungry again. Starch is medium, fiber is high. So often that's why you'll find foods fortified with fiber because the intent, especially breakfast cereals, often fortified with fiber because the intention is to keep us full for longer so that we don't snack. That's the thinking at least. So that's some of the, that's a summary really of the structure, complexity, sweetness, glycemic index, insulin index, and satiety of the different types of carbohydrates.
let's finish up here then by talking about what foods contain these different types of carbohydrates and how you might want to incorporate some of these into your diet so we said the sugars the starches and the fiber and i've already mentioned uh, for example with fruits you will get fruits that contain sugars um, like fructose but also plenty of fiber so when we're talking about foods, we need to recognize that some foods have a mixture of these different carbohydrates. But generally speaking, we can classify them in this way. Sugars would be foods like honey, fruits, and then some of the processed stuff like chocolate and sweets and so on. So we've got natural sugars and we've got processed sugars as well. In terms of starches, we're looking at things like pasta, potatoes. These are those longer chain um, carbohydrates. Uh, more complex take longer to break down so they keep us fuller for longer cereals rice grains that sort of thing and then fiber as we've mentioned can come into either of these two previous categories but that would be things like um, green vegetables potatoes whole grains wherever possible whole grain rice and that sort of thing and pulses and those again they're indigestible but they have the impact of making us feel full for longer so that's why you get for example fiber fortified breakfast cereal um, and the idea is that it keeps you fuller for longer so you don't snack between breakfast and lunch so we've thought a bit about carbohydrates we've gone into a little bit of depth we've talked a little bit about the chemistry behind them and how that affects the way that our body uses them and how they taste and so on and we've thought a little bit about the role of carbs in our diet in terms of energy production and energy provision and also how we store them and where we store them i hope it's been a helpful video for you if you've got any questions or comments please do ask them in the comments section otherwise don't forget to like the video please do subscribe it's massively helpful um, hit the notification icon as well and you'll get notified every time I upload stuff like this. Um, other than that, hope that's been helpful. Have a great day.